chess and me, you know, it's like it's hard to take them apart, you know. Today we have a glimpse into the obsessive genius of Bobby Fischer. Born in 1943, Fischer was a reserve child and was fascinated by board games and puzzles. He got into chess when his sister Joanne bought him a chess board at the age of six. Fischer was so obsessed with the game that his mother got worried and showed him to a psychiatrist. But for Fischer, chess became his life. He would run through chess books throughout the day and then pester his mom to take him to Washington Square Park where he could battle hustlers. In 1956, he won the US Championship, the youngest ever to do so. His queen's sacrifice against Bern was regarded as the move of the century, a stroke of pure genius. Although the first time Fischer faced Fasky, he ended up losing to the King's Gambit, losing a piece in the endgame. To become world champion, Fischer had to cross four hurdles. In 1962, Fischer soared through the regional and the interzonal tournaments, but he came fourth in the candidates. He blamed it on the Soviets taking quick draws and playing as a team to save their energy for their matches against Fischer. In this cycle, Tigran Petrosian went on to become the world champion. This blame game continued in the next year as well when he did not even play the interzonals even though he won the US championships with a perfect score. He repeated this feat three years later. His demands of having the candidates as a knockout event were agreed. However, at the interzonals, he stay at the board was quite short. He kept complaining about the noise, the tight schedule. As Shevsky pressed his clock, Fischer was nowhere to be seen. Just minutes before losing by four feet, Fischer shows up and wipes Shevsky off the board. He then leaves the tournament midway, leaving his dreams unfulfilled. It was a difficult world to understand for Fischer outside the 64 squares of the chessboard. In his next try, Fischer boycotted the US Championship itself. He wrote a letter to the US Chess Federation requesting the number of rounds be doubled. But the other players disagreed. Unlike him, not everyone was a professional and could take so much time out of their lives for the tournament. But everyone in America knew Fischer was their only chance to defeat Spassky. In came Paul Benko, who sacrificed his spot in the interzonals to give Fischer a dream shot at the World Championship. Fischer won the interzonals with a margin of 3.5 points to qualify for the candidates. The candidates was an eight-player knockout event where Fischer played Taimanov in the quarterfinals. Taimanov was a strong Soviet grandmaster and world-class pianist who dismissed Fischer as a mere computer. However, nothing would have prepared Taimanov for the whitewash of his life, losing 6-0 to Fischer. Soviets could not believe it. They felt there was something political about this loss and he was scrutinized at all levels. He was thrown off the USSR team, forbidden to travel for two years, stripped of his monthly stipend, he was even banned from performing in concerts. In Taimanov's own words, it looked like he had robbed the Bank of Canada and smuggled millions of dollars into the country. In the semi-finals, Fischer faced Bent Larsen, somebody who had defeated him twice before. However, Fischer won the first game, the second, the third and the fourth and by that time Larsen had fallen ill and a doctor had to be called. The sheer demolition that would make your opponents fall sick was second nature to Fischer. Then Fischer finished him off 6-0. Fischer's final opponent was Tigran Petrosian. The story goes that once Fischer saw Petrosian in his hotel and his face looked so sad that Fischer requested the organizers to shift his hotel because he could not bear looking at Petrosian. Although this match was a bit closer, Fischer did win convincingly with 6.5, 2.5 and gained the right to challenge Spassky. After months of deliberation by both teams, Iceland was decided as the tournament venue. One of Fischer's aides, I.M. Wade, researched all of Spassky's published games, covering up a thousand pages and sent it to Fischer. But Fischer was mad, replying, can't you follow even the simplest of instructions as his preferred method of mutation was not followed and the international master had to do it all again. But once it was done, Fischer carried this dossier of Spassky games everywhere he went to, including restaurants. Ten days before the World Championship, Spassky took a flight to Iceland to acclimatize to the host conditions. He had a team of three seconds that helped him prepare against Bobby. In stark contrast, Fischer had no seconds and at the last moment, William Lombardi, Grandmaster turned priest who had defeated Spassky in the past, took that position. 
The prize money was $78,000 for the winner, which turns out to be half a million dollars in today's terms and $46,000 for the loser. The players would also receive a 30% share from the TV rights. Fisher arrives at the airport and a reporter takes a picture of him, scares him off and Fisher dashes out of the airport. Meanwhile, the opening ceremony is underway. Spassky arrives for the match and is greeted by an empty chair. Now Fisher is demanding even more money just to show up. Today the International Chess Federation postponed by 48 hours the start of the match, but it said if Fisher is not in Iceland by noon on Tuesday, he will be disqualified. A London millionaire and a chess fan decided to sponsor this money for the event just so that the event could go on. And this meant Fisher had the incentive to show up in Iceland. When asked if all these tactics were just to psych out his opponent, he answered, No, uh -uh. I don't believe in uh, psychology. I believe in good moves. Bobby Fischer left New York for Iceland. And what a scene that was on the morning of July the 4th. He landed in Iceland to cheers from the crowd, but Bobby, as usual, ran straight for the car. People were tuning into the event from work, home, and everywhere else. Paskey arrives for Game 1, but Fisher is nowhere to be seen. Paskey is getting visibly anxious as Fisher finally arrives. Fisher replies with one knight f6 to Spassky's d4. The problem brews on move 1 itself. Fisher is irritated by the cameras. But the worst was yet to come. Fisher captures on h2, making a beginner's blunder, trapping his bishop. What he likely missed is that after White's move, bishop to d2, his bishop has nowhere to go. And Spassky took a 1-0 lead. Fisher was furious. He wanted the cameras to go at all costs or he would once again quit the championship. The organizers could not agree to remove the cameras. Their entire financial model was based on the TV rights. What the entire world witnessed was a broken Spassky waiting for Fisher to show up until the arbiter convened and declared Spassky the winner. As Spassky took a 2-0 lead, his mental state was not the best. People around him mentioned he constantly talked about Fisher and could not think about anything else. For Game 3, a compromise was reached. The match would be played in a backstage room. The game itself was spectacular. Fisher's move Knight H5 was a new concept at that time. Spassky could not retreat it over the board. As Fisher defeated Spassky for the first time in his life, it sparked a huge interest in the game. One reporter who surveyed 21 bars at that point mentioned 18 were showing the Fisher-Spassky game. Chess had become a symbol of national pride and was out in the streets. Now the pressure was on Spassky. In the match, I felt myself quite unusually like before. So that was a reason to, to be for myself. I'm not a suspicious man, to become suspicious. The lights, the chairs, everything was inspected and all that was found were two dead flies. As Fisher was high in confidence, he agreed to come to the main hall and the clocks were started. What happened in Game 6 is mildly classified as the game of the century. Fisher surprised everyone by playing 1c4, something which he had almost never played in his entire life. With months of Spassky's prep completely useless, Spassky went for the Queen's Gambit declined in hope of salvation. Fisher showed no mercy. Fisher's 13th move, Queen A3, put Spassky's queenside under a lot of pressure when his pieces were not developed. It was only the start, however, with his 20th move, E4, an absolute beauty, Fisher rips open Spassky's weakened center. His queen switches to the king's side, close to Black's king, on move 24. When Fisher's entire army was ready to strike, he sacrificed in exchange with rook takes f6, exposing Spassky's king, to which Spassky had no defense. And soon, on move 41, he had to resign. Fischer had taken the lead in the match for the first time. The game was so impressive that Spassky did this. Fisher defeated Spassky 12 and a half, 8 and a half to become the next world champion. Fisher united the nation and made the game of chess popular 
like never before. Michel Eta forfeited his title to Anatoly Karpov without even playing a move on the board. He still had two more gifts for the chess community. One is the Fisher Clock, which adds increment after each move, and the second is Fisher Random Chess, also known as Chess 960.